Right, welcome back. Um, very good to see that some of you <laughs> came back <laughs> and some new faces as well. Um, I'm sure that uh, more will turn up, but while we wait, uh, I'm going to show a couple of uh, slides as, again, opening remarks, uh, mostly going through the program. So yesterday was uh, industry and startups, today is industry and research. Uh, basically what this means is that um, yesterday there was a startup focus, right, startup battle, a few, uh, a few startups pitched, pitched and uh, there's this um, track also on investment in AI. Um, there are also a few startups today. If you look at the, the demo sessions, some of them are very interesting startups. Maybe they've been around for a little longer than those that we saw yesterday. Uh, and all right, today there's this research aspect. Um, I guess that what this means is that some of the talks are maybe a little bit more advanced uh, than yesterday uh, on average. But there's also another track focused on tools and um, ways that you can easily get started uh, with machine learning. Uh, we've got this track in the other room. Um, so that's this one, tools and demos. Uh, you know what, actually I'm not on the right page. I mean, this is my personalized schedule. Um, by the way, who's using the, uh, the app and the, the personalized schedule? Quite a few, not everyone. All right, I can only encourage you to check out this app because um, we try to go paperless this time around. And um, beyond, you know, saving forests and so on, uh, I think it's pretty useful. Uh, so you can create your own schedule and uh, there's a nice mobile version. So I was talking about these tools and demos that's going to be in the other room back there. And uh, giving you an overview of um, you know what's out there in terms of uh, tools to uh, make it easier to experiment with machine learning, but also to deploy it into production. Um, what else do we have? All right, and in this room we will have this um, track on new machine learning techniques uh, with things that are not completely mainstream yet. But if um, you look at one of these talks um, on what is it, on um, federated learning. I think that um, um, one of the takeaways is that the future of machine learning is decentralized. So we could argue on that, but I think that'd be very interesting to see. Anyways, um, all right, some, some new machine learning techniques, distributed learning also is going to make an appearance, and um, automated machine learning, be it feature extraction, feature engineering, um, in general, in the context of time series. Uh, so this is what you'll find in this room, right? And um, in the afternoon, still in the other room, um, so after these tools and demos, um, is this track that we've called Machine Learning from the Trenches. So trying to communicate some lessons learned from experience, from you know, integrating machine learning into um, various domains and, um, and yeah, sharing interesting uh, lessons from that. Uh, what else can I say? Uh, again, there's um, coffee and tea here uh, during the tea breaks, but also downstairs. And downstairs, you'll find those um, product workshops and tutorials. I think two of them today. Yep. Um, this one is um, using Big MN, and this one is, is using Rapid Miner. Um, so definitely check those out if uh, you've you were interested by them uh, from the, the tools and demos, the, the short tools and demos in um, the morning session. So these will go a little bit more in detail. And um, yeah, also on level 38 will be lunch break. Um, and this is where the expo area is. So if you want to you know, talk more to some of our partners, sponsors, startups that uh, pitched yesterday, uh, that's the place to go. All right, but before we, um, so I haven't said anything about this morning's session. I mean, before we split to parallel tracks, um, we'll start with the keynote um, and then move on to demos. Uh, sometimes we do lightning talks. This time around, we um, we tried a slightly different format with uh, hands-on demos of also in a tools, um, but tools that might be specialized in certain domains, uh, be it uh, healthcare 
or B8. Um, I mean, you'll see. Um, a few 10-minute ten, ten practical demos to start with, and um, then, as I said, parallel tracks. All right. Let me switch back to those slides. This is so zoomed out, I'm getting lost. Um, yeah, that's about it for me. Um, again, check out the, the mobile app. Go to pepis.io on your mobile and then click that link here. That takes you to the mobile app if you're not on this app yet. And that's where you'll find, again, the practical information, how to get on the Wi-Fi and so on. Um, and before I um, give the floor to Martin, I'd like to thank again all of the wonderful partners that help us make this conference happen. All right, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Goodson on stage. Martin is the CEO of uh, one of London's uh, very fine AI startups, Evolution AI. And uh, Martin will talk about the limits of decision making with AI. So please join me in a round of applause. Thank you, Lou. Hello, everyone. So, I, um, as Louis said, I'm the CEO and Chief Scientist at Evolution AI. So, so we make a platform for building natural language processing systems, mainly for regulated entities, so, so banks, uh, government agencies, kind of environment where they're very risk averse. They don't, people are a bit worried about using AI machine learning. Um, they're really worried um, that the systems are not ethical or they're not going to meet the constraints of the regulator. Um, so it's kind of on us to prove that our systems are robust and they're not doing weird things. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today, how to build AI systems which are uh, more robust and less unpredictable. So these, these are Russian mind dogs. These, these guys were trained by the Russian army in World War II to run underneath German tanks um, and destroy them like this. So the idea was that they run under the tank and then this mechanism um, would kind of fire and then these explosives would blow up, blowing up the enemy tank and the dog. The thing is, when they deployed these things in, in the field, they ran out, they ran towards the German tanks and they stopped and then they ran back again and ran underneath the Russian vehicles and destroyed all of the Russian vehicles causing complete pandemonium. The problem was that when they trained the dogs, they didn't have any German tanks, they only had Russian tanks. Right? And, and Russian tanks ran on diesel, and German tanks ran on petrol. Turns out the petrol and diesel smell quite different to dogs, and they didn't really get the picture. This is what happens when your training data is not representative of the production setting, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today. So this is, a, this is an example um, from my own experience uh, it's a company um, that we were doing some consulting for. They, uh, an engineer, had built uh, a topic classifier. So it, um, they, 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 their use case was that they had newspaper articles on newspaper websites, uh, and they wanted to know what the topic was. You know, is it technology, news, entertainment, sport, whatever. So this classifier seems to perform really, really well in evaluation. Had really good test accuracy, really good precision and recall. Um, except the customers were really unhappy and constantly phoning up and complaining because it didn't seem to be working at all in practice, in production. Um, you know, in particular, the things like technology, it was just basically completely perfect, giving completely perfect results, which was weird. Um, so I looked at the data and it was obvious that what was going on was because the inputs to this classifier were uh, the body text of the web page plus the URL and like the title of the page and stuff. Um, there was some real, really bad overfitting going on, um, and that's because newspapers use really distinctive strings in their URLs for different topics. So in this case, Daily Mail, anything to do with technology is going to have this string science tech in it, um, which is potentially going to be a problem if you don't do the evaluation properly. In particular, if you allow articles from the Daily Mail to be in both the training data and the test data, you won't realize that this overfitting is happening and your evaluation metrics will look really, really good uh, and they won't be reflective 
of the performance of the system in the production setting. So this is a case of data leakage, um, which I think has already been mentioned yesterday, and I, I'm going to give a few examples. And it's a real problem. I see this a lot. So, in, so for instance, at the end of this story is that I told the engineer to, um, instead of doing this kind of mixing up of the, of the data between the training and the test data, to segregate publications so that all of the daily mail would be, either be in the training data or the test data, all of the independent would either be in the training data or the test data. And this gives a much better indication of what, how the system is going to perform in practice. And in fact, the, the accuracy was, was actually terrible um, and, and was a much better indication of the truth. This next example is really, really similar. So a, a company that we worked with, they needed to build a uh, classifier for products using product descriptions. So just read the description of the products and figure out what kind of products is this. Is it an electric toothbrush, whatever. The problem, again, is that lots of suppliers can sell exactly the same product. Uh, again, if you, don't fig if you don't realize this is going on, this company didn't realize this was going on, you end up with the same products being in the training data and the test data. So effectively, you've just got duplicate rows um, without realizing it. Um, uh, again, your evaluation metrics can, cannot be trusted in this, in this scenario. Um, and we fixed, when we fixed this um, for this company, they, 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 their, their evaluation metrics started to make a lot more sense. It's ProSerg. So this comes from a Kaggle competition for uh, detecting or predicting prostate cancer using biochemical markers, blood test results, things like that. So there's uh, hundreds of variables. One of the variables was called ProSerg. Um, it, was, it seemed to have really good predictive power. So everyone was using it. It was um, very powerful. You know, I mean, it's exciting, right? Because it, it could mean a breakthrough in the etiology of prostate cancer. We could, it could be a new biochemical marker. Unfortunately, under investigation, somebody realized that ProSerg stood for prostate surgery, which meant that these people had obviously already been diagnosed and they'd already had surgery. This was completely useless um, for any system in production. And this is a real, this happens a lot actually in, in competitions, especially because, you know, in something like a Kaggle competition, the, the competitors don't necessarily know what the variables mean. This is just kind of like a whole bunch of variables with different coded names. Um, so this, this is, this is, there are many cases of this happening and competi competitions have been stopped because of this data leakage problem. So this next example, this is really nasty. This is not data leakage, but it's, it's horrible. So this is a marketing information from a company called Predpol. They do predictive policing. So in the States, they, and, and increasingly in the UK, they, they use this kind of software to um, decide where police resources should be going. Now, where they're trying to predict where crimes are happening so that they can predict where police, uh, police should be patrolling. Now, some statisticians took a look at Predpol and they realized that one of the key uh, inputs was historical data on arrests. So, for instance, this is a heat map of arrests for drug use in Oakland, in California. Um, and you can see that most of it is kind of in this red um, bit, um, which is an area which is predominantly African-American, um, which, is, which is a bias, actually, because um, drug use in Oakland is very evenly distributed between um, black areas and white areas. So what these guys figured out was, because this was an input to the, to the, to the model, this would lead to more police being deployed to those African-American areas, which would lead to more stop and search, which would lead to more arrests for drug use in those areas, and a feedback loop would be set up. And doing some simulations, um, they were able to show that eventually the use of this system would lead to nearly all of the police resources being devoted to the African-American areas, which would, um, which would lead, to, obviously, to comp a, a massive racial bias in, in arrests for drug use. So this kind of thing, you know, there, there are a few anecdotal evidence, uh, anecdotal stories of things like this happening um, in the literature. Obviously, it's much, probably happening a lot more in industry, but because of the, the lack of transparency in industry, it's, it's not uh, so visible. But in academia, this kind of thing has been happening a lot. And people have been starting to, have started to ask the question, you know, is modern machine learning really 
Is it really intelligent, or is it just is it just performing a trick? So um, this is um, really interesting work from Bob Storm at, at Queen Mary's College. Um, this um, he looked at a prize, so a competition winning um, classifier for for genre classification. So this is musical genre classification. Um, so don't look at the dotted lines; only look at the solid lines. What he did was. Um, he changed the tempo of musical files um, very, very slightly. So the tempo change here on the x-axis only goes up to 9%. So humans can't really detect a tempo change of less than about 4%. So for a human, uh, you know, a tango is going to sound the same whether you change the tempo by whatever percentage. It doesn't make any difference. Um, what he realized with this classifier, um, which was, so it won this competition. It performed really well in evaluation. Um, so the inputs were for pieces of music, audio, uh, and the outputs were the class of the, of the, um, the genre. Um, but what he realized was it was really, really sensitive to tempo. Um, and if you could change the temp tempo just by a couple of percent, and the F score, so the, the accuracy would just plummet completely. So the F score here on the, on the Y axis. And when he looked into this a bit more carefully, he saw that this is the reason. So the, this is the training data for that competition. Um, so on the x-axis is just the file index, and on the y-axis you've got tempo. So essentially what was going on was that the training data, in the training data, each category or each genre or each example, so each, each of these dots is an example, a musical file, each of these uh, examples in a particular genre was clustered, the tempo was clustered around a really, really narrow band. So like all of the sambas are at 100 BPM, basically. So what was going on was that this system this genre classifier wasn't a genre classifier at all. It's a tempo classifier. Um, and it was, he, he's, he's done a lot of work on musical genre classification. In fact, he did a really nice review of all of the, all, all of the papers about musical genre classification in 10 years. Um, and he, and he, he made this really astonishing statement in this review, which is, we show that none of the evaluation, evaluations in these many works is valid to produce conclusions with respect to recognizing genre. So essentially, all of the classifiers in all of these papers um, could have been uh, doing something completely different to recognizing genre. Class of, uh, for instance, recognizing tempo, or the other big scandal in the field of musical genre classification is that one of the big data sets, one of the key data sets in the field, was subject to data leakage in exactly the way that I, I've described. Um, and in that case, it was, the, it, it was that artists um, were not segregated between the training and the test data. So the same artist would be in the training and the test data. Nobody realized this was going on for years. Uh, this is leading to exactly the same kind of results that I described for product classification um, and topic classification. So it's a real problem, and it's very difficult to detect. So, you know, some people say, you know, people have really started to seriously say, does this mean that machine intelligence is fundamentally different from mammalian intelligence? This is a mammalian intelligence. She's my cat, called Lula. I, I, yeah, so, sorry. I used to think, I used to think she's really close. This is in her in her litter tray. Like when she goes to the toilet, she like scrapes up the litter, like covers up over herself, and I just think that's just really, that's really clever. She's really hygienic. Uh, uh, and when you know when cats evolved in the African savanna, um, this would be really sensible because they're covering up the scent so that hyenas can can uh, predate them. Um, so it's just you know this is like really good case of animal intelligence. The thing is, I, I, I put her in, I moved the litter tray into the fireplace. So that, that, this is the fireplace. It's not some kind of weird cat prison, like, like someone said to me once. But <laughs> what I noticed was, when she, once she's in there, she like, she now, now she scrapes the brick wall. She doesn't scrape the litter at all. She scrapes the brick wall in exactly the same way. So she's not intelligent at all. She's just like doing some weird mechanical thing. So maybe mammalian intelligence is, is kind of lacking. And, and people have looked at this. So this is, um, it's just, some people have looked at whether cats can tell the difference between shapes, and they can they can tell the difference really with a high degree of accuracy between triangles and the letter I, for instance. That, that's, they did a lot of evaluation on this. It's, it's very well established. But then they did a bit more sophisticated analysis, and they found out that actually, for a cat, this triangle shape is exactly the same as the circle shape, and the I is the same as the U, and they couldn't distinguish between these characters at all. And so what was going on here was that really they were looking at 
the density of ink. They weren't really looking at the shape at all. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what this is about animal intelligence, but it, I think it does say that these problems in evaluation, um, uh, that, that evaluating intelligence is really, really difficult for, for mammals and for uh, machines. Um, I mean, maybe even, even humans are, are subject to the same thing. So when most people see an image like this, um, these diagonal lines, they say, are, uh, they, if you ask them to estimate what the angle of these diagonal lines are, are they, they say like about 10 degrees. Um, I don't know what you guys think. But if, you, if they're actually completely horizontal, I'm sure you will have guessed that, uh, and you can prove it just by blurring them. So why am I, why am I talking about this? I, th I think I'm trying to say these problems um, are not fundamental to machine intelligence. I think intelligence is always context dependent. It's not like machine intelligence is totally context dependent and mammalian intelligence is like totally fluid uh, and, and it's a difference in kind. I think there's a continuum. Um, and I think that evaluation is, is, is very difficult um, for all sorts of intelligent behavior. So what can we do about this uh, kind of problem? How can we build systems which are robust and are not making the wrong decisions and not doing any weird, unpredictable things? So one very important thing um, is to understand why your model is making its decisions. And it's really easy to forget this, I, I, I think, in practice. So for instance, just to give an example, in the ProSerg case, you know, if someone had done a linear model right at the beginning, um, you know, really simple linear model, they could look at the coefficients, they could realize that ProSerg was like ridiculously weighted, uh, completely predictive, and then start to investigate and realize that something was going on. But, you know, who wants to use a linear model? Everyone wants to use deep learning, right? So, so fortunately, you can, you can do very, very similar things, or it's slightly trickier. Um, but in, this is a case from Facebook AI research um, where they looked um, uh, using, I don't know whether this has been covered already, but something called attention mechanisms, which are essentially looking, asking which pixels in an image are most um, weighted or being most relied on to make a decision. So this is a visual question answering classifier. Um, you're supposed to ask questions about these images, and it's supposed to give you an answer. Um, on the, so the first column is just what, the, what is the question, and this is the test image. The second column is where do humans look in order to answer that question using eye tracking um, experiments. And then the third column is a, a classifier that works really well in evaluation for this, for this um, particular data set. Um, and we're asking which pixels does that classifier rely on to make the decision. So the first row is, the question is, what is covering the windows? And the human looks at the top of the windows, they're looking for curtains, blinds, whatever. The machine learning classifier seems to be just randomly looking around the thing. Um, it doesn't seem to be showing the kind of behavior that you would expect if it was answering the question in the same way as the human. Uh, and the same thing with the, with the second row. And the, the question is, what is the man doing? The human looks at the man, looks at the thing that he's throwing in the air, which is a frisbee. Um, the machine learning classifier basically just looks randomly all over the image. And if you had really good results in evaluation, but your system looked like this, then I think that you would start to um, question whether your classifier was actually doing what you wanted it to do. And maybe it was picking up on some kind of data leakage or some other kind of weird thing in the, in the, in the, in the data set. Um, that was not going to be, that I think would indicate that the system was not going to work very well in practice. Um, so that's, I mean, this is a particular class of algorithms that use these attention mechanisms, um, but not every, uh, not every architecture uses attention mechanisms. So, but fortunately, some, some, uh, some people have published a paper, um, researchers have published a paper uh, last year um, the reference is all, all, all at the end, by the way. Um, which, and so this paper has demonstrated how you can use um, techniques from um, this field of, of generation of adversarial examples. Um, details are in the paper, but uh, effectively what they're saying is um, you can take just a vanilla convolutional neural network or some, some vanilla deep learning architecture and add on this kind of explainability using an all-purpose algorithm. I'm not going to go into the details unless there are questions about it, um, but, but um, just to give you the details on this particular um, figure, 
um, what's going on is the, the black, uh, the class name, the true class name is in black. Um, and then let's just have a look on the third column. So the true class here is a tripod, and this black thing is a tripod. Um, and what the classifier thinks it is, is in red, so it thinks it's a sewing machine. Um, and by using this, expla this explanation, which has been generated by this algorithm, um, you can see why it thinks it's a sewing machine, because it's concentrating on these pixels that kind of look like a sewing machine, right? But you can see that it's not concentrating on the foreground objects. It's clearly not f focusing on the foreground objects, even if you didn't know what that was, even if you didn't know it was about a tripod, you would have a sense that this is kind of making a, a mistake. Um, I'm happy to take questions on, 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 and go into details on this. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit uh, technical. Um, the other thing that you can do would, is just to look at some examples. So, um, you know, the classic case of this would be to look at Wurtzevec, the way that in the, the original Wurtzevec um, uh, paper by Mikolov, um, they, they, they generated some word embeddings and they showed that um, similar words that you, you, that you know as a, as a human, as an English language speaker know that, you know, um, yeah, like king is similar to the word prince, you would expect those to be similar in the embedding space and, and it, indeed they were. So just looking at examples is a really powerful way. Um, or, uh, so that's just looking at similar, similar examples. Um, but you can also generate some examples. So um, this, is a, this is a nice example that came from Google um, where they, um, they basically took a random image, so an image formed of random pixels and perturbed those random pixels in order to move them more towards the kind of, the kind of uh, input that would uh, apply for a particular class. So this is an image classification task. And in this case, they said, show me um, images, generate some images which look like the class for dumbbell. Okay. Now clearly you can see these are not really good pictures of dumbbells because they've all got human arms attached, right? So, so th th this makes you think this classifier has not really, gal it's not really got to the nub of what a dumbbell is. It's just been, it's got so many training examples where there's a human arm attached that it's kind of got a bit confused between a human forearm uh, um, and a dumbbell. So, um, and these generated examples are a really powerful way of, of, um, of checking that the model is doing what you think it's doing. Um, so, all of these examples, all of the kind of failure examples that I've showed you, uh, they all performed really well in evaluation. That's the, that's the common characteristic between all of them. They all performed well in evaluation. They all had really good test accuracy, and yet they all completely failed in, in production setting. So this, this is really the only message that, that, I, that I'm trying to say here, which is that uh, don't take evaluation metrics at face value. Like accuracy metrics are just a summary statistic. Test sets are just a summary of the, da the data. Uh, so you're just looking at a summary of another summary uh, evaluation metrics, um, simple evaluation metrics, I think, are not the end of evaluation. They're just the beginning of evaluation. Um, and so thank you for listening. Um, uh, get in touch. I'm, so I'm really, really interested in all, all of these topics. Um, I'm really interested in uh, creating codes of best practice for building robust AI systems. So get in touch on LinkedIn or by email, or, or I'm going to be here for the rest of the day or for the morning. Um, and if you want to sign up for our beta, so we have a natural language processing system um, which can be used to build state-of-the-art natural language processing pipelines. Um, and it has some inbuilt mechanisms to avoid some of the errors that I've uh, talked about today. So if you want to sign up for that, then get in touch or just sign up on, on that URL. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Questions? Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentation. It was great. Uh, one of the slides you talked about um, identifying window, right? Uh, how, how a human would do it as a Which one? The, the picture of windows. Oh, yeah. And then um, the, the machine is trying to identify the window as opposed to the, the human. And, and to me, that's. I mean, the human obviously looks at the windows. The machine seems to be kind of try to locate the space between the windows, right? So uh, to me, Do you like, think it, so? I mean, 
I, I it's, it's can't tell just by looking at just one photo, but I mean. Just to be clear on this, so the, yes. the, the actual, um, this, this uh, uh, algorithm is trying to answer a question about the picture. So the question is, what is covering the windows? You probably can't read it, but, but the question is, what is covering the windows? The answer is blinds. Mm. So that, that's what's going on here. Um, but go, go ahead. So I guess my question is like, you know, it, when you kind of thinking about the validity of your model, um, because machine has a different way to sort of get there, right? Whether it's, it's not a direct way of looking at the, the window, maybe it's just looking for the spaces between the window in order to identify window. Well, that's not really the question here. Um, so is that sort of type of question you would like to go through when you're questioning validity of the model? Because they have different ways, right? And the other example you talked about is that, uh, was it uh, the tempo, um, the correlation mm -hmm. between that mm -hmm. and the, the genre, right? And then uh, perhaps there's something there, and then it's using just sort of, um, you know, a bunch of correlation to identify the templates, which happens to be really effective in order to sort of classify yeah. with regards to yeah. genre. So to me, why would that be invalid? Like, yeah. it's That's a good question. I mean, that, that is a, a legitimate approach to this, which is some people say, well, if it works, it works. If it cor correctly identifies the genre, then, then who cares whether, and some like adversarial test set where you've perturbed the tempo, then, then um, that, that's irrelevant to this thing. But I mean, for instance, I showed you the training examples for Samba were all at 100 BPM. Well, Samba in, as a genre, they're not all at BPM in reality. So it's f absolutely fine if you're only going to test on that one test set. And that's why I gave the example of the, uh, the, 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 the anti-tank dogs, because yeah. that's the whole point. It, it, this is, everything works perfectly if your test set is absolutely representative of your um, production, of the production setting, and your, uh, and your training data is completely representative of your production setting. But in my experience, that's never the case. It's never the case. Um, and the music, music genre is a very good example of that. I mean, play a record, you know, play vinyl record, and you will definitely see, t you know, variations in tempo of more than 1%. Um, and also, I mean, just musicians play music at different tempos, clearly. And uh, that, 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 Exact, that, that, that data set was completely unrepresentative of, of reality. And in the case of this, um, this what's covering the windows, the, I think the sense here is that, I mean, if, this, if the machine's not even looking at the windows to answer the question, what's covering the windows, it, it could be doing all sorts. It, you know, it could be picking up on any kind of weird variation in the data, in the data set that's a, a bias. You know, for instance, there was a competition for, um, there was a competition for looking at identifying right whales uh, in, from audio. So just taking an audio um, sample and asking, uh, does this contain the, the call of an, a right whale? Um, that was a competition that had to be stopped because somebody realized that the file sizes of the audio were correlated with the, 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 the class, with the label. So if your system is not even look, listens to the audio, it's just looking at the file size, <coughs> then it's, you're justified in thinking maybe it's picking up on some weird data leakage thing rather than the actual thing that you're trying to look at. I mean, it's just an indication. This is just one piece of evaluation. Thank you. Isn't that the actual definition of intelligent, to look at the most relevant information to make the prediction? Because a learning system is depend, uh, it learns from experience, and yeah. all the experience mm -hmm. he has is that yeah. you give it. You're so the fact that me. he's using the one single simplest piece of information to make the prediction, is, yeah. it shows that he's extremely intelligent. Yeah, you're agreeing with way. me, right? That, that's my argument here. My argument is that intelligence is context dependent. There's no such thing as an intelligence that's completely context free. And the example, you know, the cat example of the triangles and the, and the, and the circles, it, 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 it's just that it's not doing what you wanted it to do. It's not, I'm not saying it's not intelligent. I'm, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you. It is intelligent, but it might, does, doesn't mean that it's doing what you're trying to get it to do. Evaluation is really, really hard. That, that's, the, that's the message. Thanks for a really interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask if you feel like this might be an opportunity for us to build more um, soft metrics into the building of AI, where we put some human input back in in the form of early surveys or just kind of a human-based check on whether the algorithm is, is doing what it should be doing? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, people really don't like that. Engineers don't really like that because it's not scalable. Um, but it's, it's, I, I can't see any other way of doing it at the moment. Because what we're trying to get to the knob of is 
what is our cumin based prior? What, what do we really think about this problem? Um, and I don't know how else we're going to do it other than the kinds of things that you've suggested. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions, but while we do, um, I'd like to invite our next speaker up on stage and uh, let's, uh, let's get her set up. Uh, who, who had a question? Sorry. Over there. Okay, so on a more low level, practical level, and following your example of musical classification, mm -hmm. would you say it's, generally speaking, a good idea to insert both in the training phase or the validation phase some artificially modified points? You know, the same way that you, you could put in your training set some uh, music where you change the tempo to make it to make the training you know robust to tempo change you know and the same way for example that when you train a, a deep auto encoder you also add some noise and some scaling of images for example yeah. would you say you could do that generally speaking to to improve your the, the generalization of models yeah so um, if you look at um, the paper that they published for um, what's the name of the Microsoft thing the, for looking at 3d um, what is it called? The, 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 the Microsoft camera that came out that could look at 3D, gave you like X, Y, Z coordinates. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so when they trained that, they used a, so these, it's like a random forest that they used, and there's a really nice paper on that. But, but the training images that they used to, to discover gestures um, and kind of posture, they, they artificially perturbed them by, by like adding glasses, like spectacles onto the, in the images and hats and like diff changing the clothes and things like that to do exactly what you suggested and, and it's, I think it's a very sensible idea. But it wouldn't fix the problem with data leakage in, in that musical genre case because you've got this data leakage of artists. Um, I'm not sure how to fix that. Okay, let's uh, thank Martin again. Um, our next speaker is Noor Shaker. She's the CEO of GTN, and uh, she is going to talk about machine learning and chemistry. That's going to be very interesting. It's a 10-minute demo, and uh, off you go. All right, thank you. Very, very interesting talk. Uh, I'm going like, to take it a step further and talk more about representation and way of searching spaces and how much representation is important. So basically, you can't really take off-the-shelf machine learning tool and imagine that it's going to apply to any different problem. You have other things to worry about. And that's basically what we're doing with GTN. GTN stands for Generative Tensorial Networks, which are basically methods that we're doing, combining ideas from machine learning and quantum physics to do drug discovery. Our mission is basically to build an interdisciplinary innovation to revolutionize chemical discovery to, and improve, improve life. If you look at drug discovery pipelines, it's pretty much inefficient. You start by screening libraries of hundreds of millions of compounds, and you end up with one compound that goes to the market. The failure rate is about 90% in clinical stages. So after 15 years of development, so most of these compounds will end up not succeeding, basically, mainly because of like toxicity issues, failure in, when, when they tested on humans. So the, the whole process right now takes 15 years. It costs between three and five billion dollars. And as I said, failure rate is huge. The main reasons, as we believe, so expectations to the future are not really even great. They expect the drop in accuracy, the drop in, for, in efficiencies by half every nine years, which is basically the contradiction to every other industry. And if you, start, if you look at like, how crucial this field is, it, it's basically saving people's life. And still, the inefficiencies, the inefficiencies are really, really huge. And no other machine learning tools has so far been able to, to reverse this, this trend. And we hope that we're building the technology that, that would help us do that. We're taking the analogy here from, from machine learning, particularly generative adversarial network, where you train models on data, on images and they are somehow being able to produce some, some realistic images that you can, so, some of them manage to, to deceive humans. So we thought we can do something similar for, for chemistry. You can train models, regardless of how the models should look like, on chemicals, 
and they should be able to produce new chemicals. So basically what we want to do is to go beyond the screening libraries, it is to go beyond what humans has known about how chemicals should look like and open up a new space of chemicals that could potentially become drug, new possibilities basically. So the main problems right now in, in drug discovery is, is representation and search. When they start the, the process of discovering new compounds, they look into this very complex chemical structure, and they're very much interested in predicting their activities, in, in training machine learning tools on them. And in order for them to do that, they have to very much simplify the representation. So instead of working on the very complex quantum wave function representation or the cloud representation of the chemicals, they simplify the representation into a string representation, basically text which means that they lose a lot of the information, a lot of the relevant information, both to predict activities and to sample or to know how a good compound should look like. The other problem is search. When they start the process that I talked about in drug discovery, they start with hundreds of millions of compounds, which is basically all the compounds that have been collected or observed throughout the, the, the history of humanity. But if you look at the actual space of chemicals that could become drug, it's, it's, it's like astronomically huge. It's, in size is 10 to the power of 70, which more or less like the number of atoms in the, in the entire universe. So if, if you like, if you want to machine learning tools or like if you want to like randomly sample in the space and if you believe that you're going to stumble on something interesting, you kind of like be mistaken because the possibilities is really huge. So you want to be like, you want to have a more efficient, more effective way of knowing which areas in the space are interesting. And the way to do that is basically by combining quantum physics, machine learning and biochemistry. Nobody has done this before, so people have been applying like standard machine learning, taking RNN, GANs methods and apply it to drug discovery. People have also been looking into application of quantum physics to drug discovery, basically looking at uh, quantum mechanics and these kind of ideas. But nobody has been looking into the intersection between the three, and, and we believe there's something really, really cool that could be done within that, that, within that area. So what we're doing is basically taking this accurate representation probably the most accurate representation of chemicals, representing them as their actual wave function, bringing ideas from quantum physics, basically ten, ten, what's called tensorial networks, which are ways of modeling multibody quantum objects, and then combining that with the powerful machine learning GAN style methods in order to, to be able to predict activities and to sample, to sample new instances. The way this works is that Basically, we're taking tensorial network to represent wave functions, and then we're building a whole stack of custom machine learning tools that could take this very complex representation as input, and we have also like tensorial components within the network itself so that we can capture entanglement, we can capture quantum properties, which tend to be really crucial when you want to predict how well the compound will interact with, with the disease or will interact with the body in general. We're combining that with like either a predictive model to predict chemical activities, and those could be like something like toxicity, solubility, whether it will bind to a specific target and many other targets, like selectivity and these kind of issues. And we also like the, the ultimate goal for us is to use this method as like a first step toward building generative models to produce new, new, new chemicals. So you, you basically train, one of the projects that we're working on right now is that you train these models or like these generative models on a subset of the chemical space, and your hope is that your hope is that they will kind of generalize into other scaffolds, so predicting other chemical families in the space, which is really exciting. It's basically it basically proves that that you can train on the library that we have right now, and then you can open up a, a totally new space <coughs> unseen before. We believe. I mean, like lots of people ask me, like, why haven't people thought about it before? Machine learning has been there for a while now, and quantum chemistry is like a really old field, and it seems like an obvious solution to the problem. And my answer to this is basically it's, it's all about timing. Machine learning started to work properly in terms of like generating novel images very, very recently. The computational power has been like skyrocketing recently, and this is basically exactly what we need to, to get this method to work, at least on classical computers. The ultimate case for us is we like just having quantum computer and run simulation of wave functions and then have machine learning tools Base built on top of that, but we can we believe we can do still like a lot on classical computers, and because of the computational power right now is really huge, we can really benefit from that. So application for machine learning to generative ideas, application for quantum chemistry to for, of quantum physics to chemistry, and then the powerful 
GBU, the, the GBU power is kind of like all facilitating the, the efficient implementation of what we're thinking about. So our pipeline looks something like this. We take, right now we, we have like access to like hundreds, thousands of compounds in publicly available data set. We also have like a number of collaboration with other biotech and pharma companies, big pharma companies to get access to their in-house data set. So we train our models on, on this data set. We test them on private data set. We, right now we're using graph representation of chemical compounds. So basically representing chemicals not as string. So th something in between string and wave functions basically using graphs plus other features calculating from quantum properties. And then we're building generative models and predictive models. So far we have been focusing mainly on the prediction of chemical activities and we managed like, so our, our kind of company is about nine months old. And on the prediction side, we've been working for about five months on this right now and we have results where we beat every other standard machine learning tools. And it's like really surprising but because what we're doing is like, honestly, it's, it was, it's quite simple. We just like want the models to, to be able to capture some quantum properties even from simple representation, and we're doing that by combining some of the quantum ideas within the model itself. itself. So just like basically, you can think about it as replacing some of the layers or nodes in the network with tensorial layers. And we managed to get the accuracies up to like certain, not significantly better, but it's like it is, better enough to get people in pharma excited about what, do, what we're doing and see the potential. And we think we can do really way better by like continuing to, to advance in, in this area. So it's really, really exciting for us. So right now we have collaboration with GSK. We're working with them on the prediction of chemical activities. We have collaboration with Leo where, we're, where the goal is to produce novel chemical structures. We have a very good collaboration with the Creek Institute and with the Medicine Discovery Catapult. They're giving us access to, exclusive access to some of the largest chemical data set and also like knowledge on, on like the biology side. And we're working very, very closely with a researcher from UCL recently also Imperial. Uh, we are looking for people. We have, we, are not, we are right now a team of 11 PhDs from Cambridge, UCL, Imperial. I'm from Oldberg University in Copenhagen. Um, and we also have, have chemists, we have XGSK expert on board. And we like, yeah, we, we're hiring as well. So if, if you're interested in working with this, within like this cutting edge technology and improving, improving life in general, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Noor. There's a slight change in the order of our speakers, uh, but again, while we uh, uh, have our next speaker set up, let's uh, take one or two questions for Noor, if you have any. You go first. Um, hi, very interesting research. Have you thought how quantum computers could help if you had them? So it's basically they will help in terms of what we're doing is using tensorial representation of wave functions and the way they could help is that you can represent it under, up to a certain accuracy on classical ones but you have to compromise because the, the complexity of the problem is like really exponentially large in the number of atoms and you can't really solve this problem unless you have a quantum computer. So you get you get the accuracy up to a certain acceptable degree on classical computers and on like very, very lot, very powerful GPUs, but you will need eventually quantum computer to get probably 100% accuracy in terms of like representing wave functions. But we're also working on like a whole, st whole like list of other ways of running machine learning also on quantum computers. So when, once they're ready, because our, all of our methods are tensorial, you can also like just deploy and run also machine learning on quantum. Hello, uh, great talk. Um, my question is that uh, in drug discovery, more than in many other fields, false negatives are potentially very costly because you may miss compounds that are effective drugs that because of the size of the space, nobody ever looks at it again. So I was wondering if you could um, give us a little bit of insight into how you, how that plays into how you design your algorithms, your classifiers, and how you tweak that false positive, false negative trade-off. So we're trying to have like, probably a link to the previous talks, like we, it's 
basically about how you structure your training set and your, your validation and testing set. Our goal is like to have, to kind of close the loop between what we generate and how we test them, so that we have a generator that produces something, to, it's gonna be tested with, with like predictive models for different kind of test criteria. Some of them is gonna be like how, how likely it's gonna be like a drug, or like how likely, how, how, whether it's gonna be synthesizable or not, whether it's gonna be like patent, patentable or not, and like other toxicity issues, and how well this, so there's also like a whole range of um, similarity measures, where you can test how, how much this drug is similar to other drugs in the market already. And that will give you like some ideas about whether it's gonna become a drug or not. And then those that are high likely to become drug will be added to the data set and this kind of like augment the bias in the data set in a way. So that's like one way probably of like solving the problem. There might be others and we will keep researching. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Noor again for the great talk. Uh, next up is uh, Jorge Cardoso, yeah. who's um, a lecturer at um, UCL, and he, Jorge has been working on a very interesting platform for doing deep learning on uh, medical images. So, uh, yeah. Jorge, the floor anyway, is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, tr I'm going to try to do a short talk and then a very short demo just to show you what the kind of stuff that we're working on. Uh, but basically, I'm presenting a platform that we've been developing called NiftyNet. Um, so one of the problems that we found in the medical domain is that it's one of the few fields in imaging where um, there's a lot of field-specific knowledge. The kind of data we're working on is very different, uh, so standard packages do not have the functionality that is necessary. We work very often with 3D, 4D, 5D data sets. Things don't scale the same way. Data sets are quite enormous. The way you sample from data, the way you handle coordinate frames and how patients are oriented in scanners and things like that is very particular to the field. So we felt that the simple thing that most people do, that having a data loader connected to a standard um, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, whatever your favorite is, just doesn't scale up. There's a lot of technology that is necessary, and everyone else that is working in the field is re-implementing the same tools over and over again, and they're not following the best practices in terms of implementing those and validating those appropriately. So we basically thought, Rather than having everyone reinventing the wheel, why, can't, why don't we just put everyone's effort together? Let's try to, com to create a community tool where multiple universities can contribute to and everyone is basically implementing against an API. Uh, at the time that this started, uh, we kind of selected TensorFlow as, as, as the, the, the go-to platform. But basically, in the end, we wanted to have a platform that was able to handle all of the data that we, that, that we, that we might encounter, mostly imaging, so we're focusing mostly on medical images. Uh, we need to encode things like medical images, the pixels or the voxels in 3D. They're not really squares. They can be elongated. They can be anisotropic. Uh, and you need to handle that appropriately. So scale is quite complicated. Uh, you actually know about the resolutions of images. You know how big each pixel is. And that's super important. So there's many things that we had to include in the, in the software that we had to think from the ground up. Um, of course, we decided to go for something which is fully open source. Um, we wanted to have a very well validated and tested framework, so there is a very extensive continuous integration behind and all these things. Also, we have been working quite closely with NVIDIA to be able to scale it up to multiple GPUs, so you can run it on large clusters. And the reason for it is because memory for us is extremely um, scarce. So batch size of one is very common in medical imaging because that's how much you can fit in a GPU. So you need to really scale up to multiple GPUs to be able to do something slightly smarter than that. And doing that in an efficient way is really not trivial. And if you're a maths person or a biomedical engineer person, you might not have the computer science skills to do that, and that really stifles your research. So what we decided to do was to uh, create this modular uh, system where that, that, that tries to encompass everything that you might possibly want to do in terms of a medical image experiment for research purposes. And we, would, we provide basic building blocks that of, of this full pipeline, and we also provide you a way for you to disseminate your research into uh, our own model zoo. There's even an evaluation framework which is very, very comprehensive and runs very strong statistics, uh, compl complex evaluations on all the data that you have. And really the idea of providing it this way was that if you want to do your PhD on new methods to do data augmentation, which in medical imaging, by the way, is extremely important, then you can do that and you just rely on every other part of the framework to evolve naturally. Uh, and you can still contribute to the state of the art. 
Um, the architecture is a little bit complex, but basically what you have is kind of you have an I.O. model which knows how to load and unload the data. You know how to sample from data, you know how to handle geometry and how to handle orientations. Then the key part obviously is the network itself, which is that little part there that is within the red uh, square. Uh, and this, this network is defined uh, as a graph, and then there is an application driver that basically takes that and splits it in an optimal way through multiple GPUs on the, or basically or a cluster if you have one. Uh, and whatever the output of that is, could be an image, could be a classification or something like that, is then aggregated into an output stream, which is then pushed as an output data. And of course, you also want interfaces, for example, so that you can get data from uh, the picture archiving system of hospitals, so that you can get data from standard databases that people use in the field. All of these things really are trying, we're trying to tackle all of those. One of the key things that we looked into was abstractions to make researchers' life easier. So we want this to be a research tool, but at the same time, we want it to become a general tool so you can do relatively simple tasks that everyone wants to do. If you want to do semantic segmentation of an object, you have a tumor in an image and you've asked your clinicians to contour many, many tumors, and you'd say, okay, now here's a new image, can you just give me the new tumor? That's a very, very classical task. So we created these applications which basically define a series of elements that are key for that application. Defines the I.O. model, defines what kind of modalities, what kind of uh, networks are available, what kind of loss functions are available. And if you just want to do that relatively simple task, you can really constrain yourself to only using a configuration file that just turns things on and off. And I'm going to show you some of that in the, in the near future. But just to give you an example of what that means, for example, the example that I was giving in terms of semantic segmentation, um, if you're trying to segment this tumor, in reality what you have is your input is an image, your output is an image, so that's part of the definition of the I.O. component. In terms of loss functions, you have things that are specific to medical imaging, like dice scores and sensitivity specificity metrics, because you might want things to not miss uh, tumors. Um, then the way you sample can be made either just sample uniformly or can be made quite smart in terms of how the frequencies of different types of structures and different sizes of structures uh, contribute to the capacity and the nonlinearities that are encoded in your model. Uh, and of course, when you're doing inference on new data, you might actually want to know how uncertain you are about your boundaries, for example. You might not want to know the true segmentation because that doesn't exist, but you basically say this is where it should be, plus or minus a certain boundary which is encoded in the uncertainty. Or you might want to have a probabilistic outcome of that boundary. All of these things are essential in medical care because clinicians, what they say when they contour images, if you ask 10 clinicians to contour the same image, they will do it differently. So uncertainty is something that has to be there. And again, those things are trivial to implement, but you need to do it properly and you need to test it properly. So se semantic segmentation, for example, will be a application. Another one which is uh, quite common in other fields, uh, which is, for example, what you have when you have style transfer, uh, is to predict what one modality would look like from another modality. So in this case, we're predicting how a CT image would look like from an MR. And for some reason, they're cropped a little bit. But And what we're showing basically here is that the system is very similar to what I showed before, but rather than predicting a label, categorical label from an input image, or predicting a continuous image from another input image. So this is similar to what people see in the mapping a horse to a zebra um, type of style transfer that you've seen. Um, we also created the model zoo interface and a protocol to do that so that you can basically take the models that you train and you can push them online. And it makes it really easy for other people to uh, use the models that you train. So you can, you can really start running NiftyNet with three lines of command where you basically just take pip install NiftyNet, you download the model with one single command and then you just say run inference and you give it the file names and the configuration file and that's it. So in three lines you can basically have a full installation of the system and a working version that is actually solving your problem. And because the system actually knows how to handle the images appropriately, you do not need to pre-process the data in any way because it knows how to process the data to make it amenable for the network to use it to do its job. So since I've already spent eight minutes doing this, I'm just going very quickly. And there's a paper also describing infrastructure and things like that. So I'm going to try to do a quick demo, which never works, but let's see if it works this time. Uh, so there's a website. Um, the, there's a GitLab. The code is fully open source. You can join the consortium. You can become a developer and all these things. Uh, it's also on PyPy, so you can basically just do pp install NiftyNet. So I'm just going to SSH to my home machine, because my laptop doesn't actually have any proper GPU to do any of this. So that should be very quick. So if I just SSH to my home machine now, basically, uh, so NiftyNet is already installed, so I'm not going to go through there. Yeah, done. 
almost. So net download uh, anisotropic, um, anisotropic net spreads challenge model zoo. So that's just the name of the model. So you're just saying, please download this model uh, and put it into some folder. Uh, hopefully that will not take much time. So the idea, the yeah, I can, I can do that. I can try at least. Um, so when you do that, basically what it will do is it will pull several things. So when you define a, you need to define the application, you need to define, you actually push a file that just defines exactly the application itself, which is an extension of the main, uh, of, of the main base. And for some reason, my internet is not working on the other side. It never works. Anyway, the model is already pre-downloaded, so I'm just going to skip that part. Um, so it will download, it will create a folder um, under nifty net and then inside this that you're going to have different things you're going to have inst extensions to the model you're going to have some data which is downloaded as part of the configuration file uh, and you're going to have the train model itself uh, you have a configuration file which is going to be of this form where you define multiple different input data sets of different types of images I'm going to show you what that is you also define the labels which is the training uh, manually contoured images you define things about how the network looks like, loss functions and things like that. And at the end, you say that you want to run the segmentation problem. The outputs are some labels. You actually want to, let's say, you want to have uh, outputs probabilities equals, yeah, false is fine. So we want to output the categorical segmentation, for example, with two classes, label normalization equals false, that's it. So we just save that. So after we have the full configuration file, so I, we actually didn't change anything in the configuration file this time. But the only thing that we do is we basically say, run inference, we give it the application name, and we give it the configuration file, and we say run it on CUDA. And that what it will do is it will, in that configuration file, is pointing to the locations of where all the files exist. Uh, and what it's also going to do is it's going to load all the images, it's going to actually find out how many uh, modalities exist, if they match the model, if they don't match the model. It's going to find the sizes of all the images, so you see that this is the size of our image, so it's a 120 by 140 by 140 by 1 by 4 matrix, so it's a 5D image. Uh, and what it's going to do is going to partition this image in patches, and it's going to partition those patches in a way that is optimal depending on the amount of memory that your GPU has. So in this case, it's going to partition it in 27 different patches, but it's doing it in a way that it maximizes the amount of information that each patch has so that the solution is optimal. And so it's going to go through 27 iterations in this case. And after the 27 iterations, it's going to save the output segmentation. So let me just give it two more seconds. Yeah, so here it saves the file. So I'm going to cancel. So it's going to run on other files, but I'm going to cancel that. And I just remember that I connected. Oh, yeah. I needed to have X11 on, so I need to reconnect, obviously. Never type a password when you're doing a demo. Um, so the only thing now that I'm doing is, so he outputted that file. So now I'm loading a viewer, which again, I have the files on my computer if the, if the connection is not fast enough. But basically what he's doing is he's loading a T1 image, which is one type of MRI. He's loading a T2 image and a flare image. So I'm going to now move it to, I need to minimize this so I can show you the image. Of course, it never. Is it not showing? Right. So it's still loading up. So what you see here is, um, let me remove the segmentation. It's going very slowly. But you see here in terms of data types that the algorithm has seen. He has seen a flare image, a T1 image, and a T2 image. And those are different physical properties of the human brain. And what you see at the top, you see three views, so there are just three different slices, but this is a full volume. And what you see in light blue is the area that was localized as a tumor. So this specifically is just for the demo, is only a two-class segmentation, so it's only separating the tumor and the edema from healthy tissue. But you could do the same thing with hundreds of classes. We have models that can scale up to 150, 160 classes. Uh, so this was a demo of, a very quick demo of what uh, inference part would look like. If you want to, for example, take exactly the same thing that we were doing, but just do a training on the same data set, uh, what you can do is to basically do something like this. So it's very similar to the net run inference, but now you do net run train. 
you can give it exactly the same configurations here. And what we're saying is, actually, we already trained 15,000 iterations, and we now want to continue training until 20,000 iterations. So you're just saying, train 5,000 more iterations. So we're giving it the starting point. It could be a random one, obviously, but we're starting from a pre-trained model. And we can now feed in more data. You now have more data. You just feed in more data. You add more data. You, stare, you say, start from the model you have, keep training, and you're going to end up with a new model being saved, which is going to contain your updated training. Again, this is going to look very similar to what the one you had before. It's just that now is actually doing training rather than doing inference. It takes a little bit longer to set up because it does a lot of graph optimizations on the background, which is part of some of the things we've been working with video. Um, so this is just an example for semantic segmentation. There's a lot more in the model to do. There's a lot more that the package itself can do. Uh, so if you, oh, nice. Hmm, I'll check that later. So if, yeah, the configuration file issue. Um, so, but there's a lot more than the software can do in terms of handling um, either semantic segmentations, uh, style transfer, there's three-dimensional and four-dimensional GANs and variational autoencoders and all these things that people are doing and that are really useful also in medical domain. Uh, but there's also things, slightly simpler things like classification tools, which we're now using to diagnose people and to improve the ways that we can predict how different diseases will evolve. Anyway, so that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be very delighted to answer those. Thank you very much, Rohit. Okay. Again, while we take questions, I'm going to invite the next speaker up. Uh, is Harry King? Yep. Yeah. Uh. Uh, I just have a, a, I don't know if you have an answer for it, but I was just wondering, it says any kinds of medical images that are more, provide better results with this, like uh, certain types of cancer, or, or is there some other type of images that are really hard to get a grasp on? The medical imaging world is moving quite quickly. So there is every year there is new modalities. There are slightly different things that you can do that make the diagnosis better. We need to, one of the key areas of research in the field is making algorithms robust to changes in the type of input data you're giving it, which is very similar to the problem uh, was discussed by the keynote speaker earlier today of how do you extrapolate to new unseen types of data, which is why augmentation is extremely important. So we need to have knowledge about MR physics and imaging physics to be able to augment changes that we know it will happen on the appearance of those images so that systems become robust to those. So all of these things are crucial if you want to develop real world working systems. So yes, it, it, you need to make the systems robust to those. Otherwise, in two years time, they will not work on the new data that is coming in. Uh, one last question, maybe? Otherwise, let's just move on to the next Thank talk. You. Thank you, Jorge. Um, Uh, our next speaker is uh, Harry Keane from Anon AI, and um, I'll let Harry show us what Anon AI is about. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Hi. Um, so I'm Harry Keane. I'm CEO of Anon AI, and we're automating data anonymization using some AI tools. So. The reason we're doing this, and sorry to lower the tone, there's been very academic talks so far, but we think it's the, the wild west of data sharing in the past. So companies have been collecting data, storing data, using data quite recklessly. And that's, uh, that's been the case with, in the news recently with Facebook, uh, MyFitnessPal. These, these sort of stories are just coming more and more pertinent. So what does the future look like? Well, we think it looks a little bit more like this. So, highly regulated, businesses have to take much more uh, control over their data and have a better understanding of how it's being used. But fundamentally, we know businesses are going to want to keep on analyzing data and extracting its value. So how are they going to keep on doing that? Well, we think one of the answers is anonymization. Um, so just to take a little example, if you're working with geospatial data, you could start with a very uh, fine-grained view of the world. So you have, sort of have buckets of individuals that are uh, spread across London, for example, and you could slowly start to tune down the resolution of those buckets so you include more and more people that are sort of indistinguishable from one another. And so this will allow you to do your segmentation analysis, whatever sort of market insight you're, you're trying to do. And you can keep on tuning further and further down until you have a, effectively a bucket size of people that still allows you to do your job and to do your analysis, but maintains the individual's privacy. So actually on a record by record level, 
that could look something like starting off with a fairly uh, oh, a very fine-grained view of an individual. You can start to strip out the exact personal identifiers, like names. You could uh, put ages into age brackets and start to remove some of the uh, information from the address. And so you can keep on going further and further down the tree, increasing the bucket sizes of ages, for example, just leaving in um, information about the city, then the country, and then finally you can end up with a very low resolution record. And really, all this does is effectively make those individual records less distinguishable from the other records in the data sets. And what that really means is that we're helping companies trade off between privacy on the one hand and utility on the other. Because ultimately, if you do start to decrease the resolution of your data sets, that's when you uh, effectively start to lose some of its utility and some of its accuracy. So we have to be very careful about that. And so anonymization allows you to trade off between the two. Um, so I'm just going to just whip across to a demo now. So just bear with me. See if this works. So, if we were to start off with a data set that looks something like this, I don't know how well you can sort of see that. Sort of resolution issues here. Um, but effectively, you can see there's some there's some sensitive information in there that we can see nationality. Um, we can see some information about uh, location, job, phone number, salary type, age, and number of children. So. Effectively, these are all uh, elements and, and attributes we can start to anonymize. So the way we would do that is we would, oh, again, resolution errors. So the way we would do that, we'd ingest this, this data set, ingesting that exact same data set as a, as a CSV. Um, and what we're going to do is effectively, you'll see our, um, what we've done is we've normalized the data sets into our own particular format. And then we're identifying the column headings and sort of mapping them to our own entity types. And once we know what the entity type is, we can then start to, to generate some of these resolution hierarchies and move the data into this sort of lower dimension or uh, lower resolution space. And so what you can see is some initial um, metrics about the, the data set pop up. So we've got a K anonymity score here, which effectively is one at the moment, which means there are unique records. And then we've got utility metrics, so how useful the, effectively the data still is on an entity-by-entity entity basis. And at the moment, it's, it's at its full score. Um, and then we're also throwing into the mix some risk metrics as well, because ultimately, what businesses care about is how risky their data set is and whether they're putting their customers at risk by sharing it with third parties or uh, giving it to external software developers. So we, we try and use some me measures of, uh, or some risk modeling tools to effectively give some insight into that process. So once we've ingested the data, then we can optimize to our, effectively just our um, set of defaults, which will, will try and effectively anonymize the data, but keep as much information as possible. So uh, can you still see that? So it's very small here. But effectively, what you can see, uh, here, I'll zoom in a bit, that's rubbish. So effectively, what you can see is we've optimized to uh, make bucket sizes of three in this case. So if you took one record, it'd be indistinguishable from three others, effectively. Um, and then you can see its impact on utility over the different uh, over the different entities. So we've lost a little bit of utility here, 21% um, over this measure. And then finally, you can see, sorry, this sort of uh, wrapping uh, mess here, but it's uh, effectively it's identified nationality and identified that it's uh, an Emirati. Um, person and then sort of generalized it to uh, Asian effectively. And then what that means is all the other MRRCs and other Asian countries will be, will be um, lowered to that same resolution. And in doing so, we've sort of created this, this anonymity score. So the way we'd actually surface that up to users is um, via an interface like this. So instead of effectively um, typing in on a command line, I want a resolution of, of three or five, you can actually effectively just work with a slider here, and then you can see its effect on risk and utility. So really, I, I guess what most of you are interested in is how does that actually affect the data set? So just jumping back, if I show you uh, another example data set here. So this is some health records. Um, again, you can see some, some sensitive information. So this has been anonymized, effectively. We put ages into age brackets. Um, we've put uh, body mass indexes into, into brackets as well. Um, and effectively, 
what we're trying to predict is we're running a sort of a test here, and we're trying to predict the uh, the health charges. So there's there's going to be some interesting correlations, possibly. Uh, well, I know, I know for a fact that smoker correlates quite heavily to these to the the, char the, the medical charges of um, of these individuals, and this is this is a Kaggle data, example Kaggle data set that we've anonymized. And so, if I just jump straight back to the presentation here, um, you can see the effect. So what we've done is effectively just let that load. Effectively run different levels of anonymization, or, and then try to predict the that uh, that predict that column at the end. So. So what you can see here is effectively how the uh, the regression score falls as you increase the anonymity of that data set. And so what you can see is there is initially quite a steep drop of around 20% from the initial score. These are very, very simple linear model we're using. And um, and then it, uh, it effectively plateaus out. So what that means is that effectively you can anonymize your data, protect, protect people's uh, uh, um, privacy, and, but still maintain some of the, uh, the accuracy on your model. And so this is, this is a, effectively a tool you can use to, um, or businesses can use to effectively uh, maximize privacy of the users, but still carry on doing what they, what they need to do. Um, and these are quite high anonymity scores at the bottom as well. So it, you, can, you can sort of, at the very end of the, at the very left-hand side of that graph, you can implement sort of a K anonymity of 10 and almost and you lose no, uh, no accuracy in your, in your algorithms. Um, so, I, I mean, that's the sort of the technical, technical approach. But the way we would uh, actually implement that for a user is uh, that a sort of a data controller at a company would upload data. We'd identify the personal information automatically using some, uh, some of our... Uh, Machine learning algorithms. They can sign that. They can. Uh, they can sign that. Um, that classification off. Uh, we apply the privacy and utility sections, sec uh, settings. Um, uh, we process it. We we analyze the risk and, and we feed all that information back to the users. So they can make an informed decision and perhaps even iterate over that process until they're happy with their risk score and then they can publish that data. Um, that data can then be used for uh, third-party uh, analysis. If you're sending a data set out to a, an analytics company, it can be used for software development abroad, or even if you want to put it into GDPR, cold, uh, cold storage for G GDPR uh, regulation compliance. Um, and that really is one key point to sort of end on, is that uh, the GDPR doesn't apply to anonymous, anonymized data. So this is going to be a really critical tool that businesses can use to maintain compliance. Um, so a couple of little features as well to add on the end there that uh, the data controller or the admin user that's uploaded that data can then sort of audit and uh, revoke access to that data set as they wish. They can generate privacy impact assessments, which all feed into the sort of helping businesses achieve compliance with the GDPR. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, we're in on AI. We're automating data anonymization. I would uh, love to hear any questions. And uh, if you uh, would like to talk to me afterwards, I'll, I'll be hanging around. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really nice. Um, <laughs> one question. So, so I think I saw some of your like continuous variables, like ages. You kind of bucket them. Is that yeah. right? You yeah. bin them. Why do you do that? Because you're kind of changing the nature of that variable. It's not continuous. It's, you're turning it into a categorical variable now. Why don't you just jitter it or just add some noise or whatever? Yeah. So actually, yeah. Sort of going back to um, to that. I, what I didn't sort of suggest. There's actually three lines on that on that graph. So. Um, you can see cross bucket and test. So to answer your question specifically, like to actually obviously get a, um, often some of these models to work, you need you need a, a float. Uh, so what we would do is we take the limits of that bucket and then choose, select a random number from uh, from a uniform distribution across that bucket. Um, so effectively, the, the data is still bucketed, but it still it looks like real data. Um, and so that is effectively adding that jitter. But in order to run the anonymization maths, like working out k-anonymity, like sort of how many unique records there are, you, you sort of need these buckets in this categorical form. We can then transform it into usable data. But there's actually one more interesting point about this. There's, there's three tests we've done here. So we've, what we've done is we've split the data into tests and training sets. Um, and so what we've done is we've anonymized the test set, and then we've run the, um, the linear regression algorithm on that. Uh, and then we've we've got the uh, sorry trained the, the the algorithm on that test set uh, on that training set and then run the same model on um, the test set which is, hasn't been anonymized. So 
what that means is that you, you, well, what it's showing is that you can actually test, or you can train on anonymized data and then run the models on non-anonymized data. Now, that, what that translates to is that, for example, if you're Tesco or something, you could anonymize your data, <laughs> give it to Dunhumby, they can run a bunch of analysis, they can give you the models back, and then you can run it on your raw data, and it won't be, uh, it will still be valid, you'll still get valid results. There's a very slight expansion on your question there. But. Have you any additional metrics once the data has been pulled down into these aggregated forms that might, for example, give you information about the bins and distribution across those bins? Yeah, absolutely. So we can add columns sort of that give that information. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because that's, that's quite critical, right? If you're, if you're a data scientist, you want to know roughly how the data has been an anonymized. So um, yes, we can pull that, that, those metrics in. How anonymizable do you think that very, very high dimensional data is? So when you start having hundreds and hundreds and maybe even thousands of columns, you can't anonymize because every row is unique, even if you bin it. It's a, it's a good point. The higher the dimensionality, the stricter your, or you know, the, it it's co um, correlates to the, the, the number of records. So the more, the more records you have, effectively, the more dimensions you can have to achieve sort of lower levels of bucket, lower but, bucket but size. The problem is that you have a co combinatorial explosion in columns, but not in records, right? So your rec records will have to be on 10 to the power of 14 for you to have hundreds of columns. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it depends. If all, those, if all those records are sensitive, uh, if all those columns are sensitive, then you, you may have a, a problem anonymizing your data set. But if you're dealing with sort of customer databases or often these um, uh, data sets that, you know, simple analysis on that, they are, they are low dimensional. So um, uh, it, it, it is a solvable problem, but you're right, it's the higher dimensional data set, the more tricky it becomes. It does actually become more interesting as well when you have a sort of database with multiple tables in it, you want to look across the tables and how you anonymize like that. So there are additional complexities, yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, would you mind explaining to me a little bit more detail about how you compute that risk score for each of the data fields? Because I can understand how, you know, name, age, sex, et cetera, et cetera, like you might see that as identifying, therefore, more risky, um, but you can also see that how that would be context dependent, depending on what kind of data you're actually gathering. Yeah, absolutely. So the models we implement at the moment are, are kind of strictly academic. So, i.e., if the intention of an individual was to identify one person in that data set, how likely is it that they could do that? Um, and there's other sort of weaker models, like, I don't know, you just want to infer something about a, a particular portion of the population in which the risk will, will be higher. Um, and it's all just relates back to the bucket sizes and, and how unique the sort of the, the sort of data the, the points in the data set are. But that's that's sort of only part of the problem really, because um, a major problem with anonymization is the concept of linkage attacks. So if you have a, another data source that's been publicly um, published somewhere, you potentially could do some cross-referencing and identify the individuals against your anonymous data sets. A good example is that Netflix publishing a uh, data set that they stripped the names and e emails out of, but ultimately they had timestamps when people were watching movies and then jumping onto IMDb, rating those movies, and the, the time, because there's enough, there's a, again, there's a high-dimensional data set, they, there was enough sort of correlation between them for people to work out some individuals. So, you know, sort of encapsulating all of that knowledge is, is difficult for individual businesses. So what we're, what we're trying to do is effectively encapsulate some of that, uh, that understanding in these, in these risk scores. Hi, thank you for the talk, um, very interesting. I was curious, in, um, in fields like differential privacy, is there is a, uh, already a, uh, an approach and a mechanism towards quantifying the amount of privacy protected, gained, or lost uh, under the right conditions, keeping track of privacy budgets and so on? Yeah. Is there any kind of um, guarantee that comes from, the, um, from Siri that you can offer about the quality of anonymization that you provide under different conditions? So guarantees about the quality of anonymization. Right. Um, well, so these are well standardized scores. You've got K anonymity. I showed you there. So this is sort of the minimum bucket size. 
Um, so there are two fields of, of uh, research on this. You're, you're right, this is the more modern sort of differential privacy approach, which works very well on a query by query basis onto a data set where you can keep track of what people have seen um, and you can add noise to the results if necessary. Um, but they're, they're, you're right, there's a limited privacy budget with that approach. Um, so i.e. if you make too many queries and requests, you, your access gets revoked, for example. Um, with these bucketing strategies, you, you, have, a, you have a baseline privacy uh, sort of um, metric, and that can be k-anonymity, that can be l-diversity, that can be t-closeness, all of these different um, techniques to sort of measuring the uniqueness of the buckets. Um, and that's a, that's once you get that data set into that form, you can do an unlimited amount of queries on it. You can effectively um, use it in, in many more ways. So th we're taking this sort of bucketing approach at the moment. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Kind of. Uh, <laughs> I understand there is a metric you can measure, but what I am looking for, and maybe this is just my ignorance here, is some way to map from that metric to a specific promise you can make about how difficult or impossible it is to reverse yeah. a uh, individual record from I see what you mean. Conditions. Yeah. So the a key sort of problem with anonymization is, you know, making the guarantee that like I we couldn't we couldn't give you a data set and said there is zero zero possibility of someone being able to have find some other data set somewhere else that they could cross reference it with yours and do a de-identification de because the, you know, Theoretically speaking, that's just not possible. There could be someone that exists in the world that has unlimited resource, uh, you know, has access to all the data sets in the world. I mean, potentially Google is this person, but uh, there's, uh, there, you know, there, there, there are people out, you, you just can't, you can't sort of factor all of these into this equation. So the risk of re-identification is always going to be zero. At this very minimum, it's going to be, there's a, a very small chance. Uh, you can never make it zero, effectively. Follow up. Uh, my question is not really whether this risk can be zero or not. My question is, can there be a way to principally reason about for a particular data set, and particular anonymization strategy, uh, what is that risk? So yes, I think that's why we're trying to apply these risk models. Um, and as, a, as I say, these are sort of re relatively standardized measures of risk as well. I.e., if the, someone had this intention, how likely are they to be able to? to identify individuals. So yeah, you can quantify it. Um, it is a little bit theoretical, but at least it gives some insight for the businesses that are trying to make these decisions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Cheers. Our next speaker is uh, Saku from Asteroid, and she's going to show a demo of what Asteroid does. It's a graphics engine for programmers, and uh, off you go. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. So I'm going to talk about the thing my startup is working on, which is a graphics engine for programmers, which is um, has many applications to people and AI. Um, so just, just to give some background, why are we building something like this? I think one interesting thing about computer graphics is it's becoming more relevant to all fields of computing. So on one side, you have the whole augmented reality, um, you know, um, HoloLens, Magic Leap type thing, and on the other side, you have, um, you know, machine learning. They need, they have need for, um, you know, inputs. They, they have need for simulation um, drones and, and stuff like that. And a lot of the time, if you are building a machine learning model, you need to do something like um, build a simulation so you can test out what your um, have an environment in which to test your model, whether it's for reinforcement learning or something like that. Um, so the thing is that this is quite a different use case for than video games. So game engines have traditionally been used for entertainment. Um, stuff like Unity is mainly used for um, either making mobile games or PC console games, and that's quite different from what our story does. Um, so what we built is kind of, it looks quite similar to a regular 3D graphics editor, um, but uh, it's very easy to connect with to scripting. So if you have a TensorFlow model or something in Python, um, you can just plug and play this 3D graphics engine and, and be able to go. Um, so what are the main features? So it's a mixture of a 3D graphics editor, some inbuilt scripting capabilities, and it's also we borrowed some ideas from music software. So um, you know we have a way that you can take in various inputs and outputs, whether that be a camera or a microphone 
or something like that. Um, and another thing is that when doing stuff for Asteroid, um, we realized that a lot of what, we would, what was happening in AR and computer vision was around scene understanding computer vision, which has obviously been a really big topic in AI and ML. So um, it was partly about um, 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 <laughs> trackers for detecting planes and 3D objects, and we were also we've just built this whole UI around common ML related tasks that you might want to do related to computer vision. Um, the thing about um, why this might be relevant to machine learning is that there's actually quite a lot of overlap with what you need to build for AR. So um, yes, yeah, scene understanding is computer vision applied to the camera. Um, and another big thing is if you have an ML program um, and you want to do some simulation, um, 3D graphics might be the way you generate your data set. So one thing people in the self-driving car community have been doing is using Grand Theft Auto to do preliminary training for their models. And you know maybe that's not the uh, the ex exact right training environment for, for your simulation. So maybe you, know, you, you need to have a game engine to build such a simulation so you can test it. Um, and so the thing about Asteroid is it's very easy to plug and play like the best physics engine that you, you want. So if you want to do something like simulate a fluid or simulate um, you know, some aerospace dynamics, you can plug and play in your own scientific computing library and then have it ready to go. Um, and the, there's other ways you can use it is as a visualizer. So if you have an ML program and you've already built this model, but you want to understand how exactly it works, um, visualization is a big problem for machine learning developers. And so um, Asteroid allows you to visualize what, what exactly is going on with the model. Um, so I think now it's time for the demo. So I guess. Here is a, can you see, okay. So this is like the new release that we've just come out with, just come out of beta. Um, it's basically like a regular, you know, 3D programming environment. And so apart from being like a 3D editor, we also have native support for Apple's Core ML. So, um, for example, we can just load a pre trained model like this. Oops. And, you know, we, we, we might do something like so this model that I've loaded is SqueezeNet, the machine learning classifier. Um, and so I might just add an image as an input and then I'll, I'll just run it and then it will give me everything in like a, um, a very easy visual layout. And the, the good thing about Asteroid is you can do this kind of plug and play thing where um, you, know, you have your machine learning models ready to go, but you also have stuff like, um, you, know, you can have like basically a 3D object loaded in the scene as well. And you can do things like plug in the output of a machine learning model to the, the 3D scene. So it becomes a really easy way to, um, So for example, yeah, I might have, um, so I, I might just like have some kind of animation that I attach to that um, related to the model level reloaded. So um, it, it just came out of beta and we're just um, starting to expand to some common use cases related to ML, but that's kind of where we are at the moment. Okay. Um, I think that since it's already, oh right, 22.11, um, we'll go straight to coffee break, uh, tea break, and then back here, uh, let's say at 10 past, 10 past 11, back here and in the other room. Um, so yeah, see you in a bit.
round of talks after after the break small coffee break I think somebody said this starting at 10 past because uh, the previous talk was delayed I think that's why people are still uh, there yeah we're going to wait for just a few minutes for people to come back and Yeah. Even, yeah. <laughs> no, we, we, we're going just to wait for, for a few more people and then we, we're going to, to move on. Okay, so um, the next round of talks will be about automating uh, machine learning. Uh, first, we'll have um, Silvio Tofan from uh, Dataiku, who will uh, speak about um, automating one of the most time-consuming time process in the data science workflow, which is uh, feature engineering. Engineering, sorry. So. Um, Please, applause, uh, Silvio. <laughs> um, there's still a few people on the hallway. I'm not sure if we should uh, wait maybe two more minutes. I don't know. Uh, uh, what? Oh, yeah, do you want to? Yes. We're, we, guys, we're, we're moving on. <laughs> I think, yeah, you breaks. Break one. Breaks over. That's fine, I'll use this. Thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone. My name is Silvio. I'm a data scientist with Dataiku. Uh, you're probably expecting somebody else here today talking about uh, feature engineering. Unfortunately, my, my colleague Yu was uh, not able to attend due to unforeseen reasons. Um, so you're stuck with me, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm going to, to talk to you about automatic feature engineering and, and how we tackle this at Dataiku. So first off, I'm going to briefly talk about feature engineering. What is it for those of you who might not be uh, familiar with it? Then I'm going to go into the motivation of why did we actually tackle this problem, how can we accelerate it, and how do we keep in line with everybody else who's doing similar things, or are they similar? Then uh, I'm going to go a bit into more detail about AutoFeed, which is our uh, general purpose um, way of doing feature generation. And then finally, I'm going to, to conclude the, the talk. So first of all, what is feature um, engineering? Well, for those of you who aren't necessarily um, familiar with it, um, feature engineering is both an art as well as a science of transforming uh, raw data into valuable attributes for a prediction model. And this is a very crucial step in machine uh, learning um, in machine learning because even with the same algorithms, uh, by by using certain features, you might get better ways um, to, to, end, to get to your end results. However, there is no one feature to rule them all, um, even though some might dr dramatically improve your performance. And we like to think um, of these features as being families of features. So if we, we can think about these families of features like a battleships game. So you're trying to figure out what's the best way of predicting whatever you're trying to predict and you found something. So you hit one part of your battleship. That's your family of features. So from there, it's pretty hard to figure out what else there is in that family. And this is how you sync part of um, your opponent's fleet. And it's pretty much the, the same in, in machine learning. So how do we actually go about creating new features when we, when we move on from, um, from project to project? Well, first of all, we, we take a step back and we think about all the previous projects that we've actually worked on. And we actually end up seeing that there's really two main ways of, of doing this. Usually, it's a lot of statistical operations, <coughs> but also 
some domain knowledge. Initially, when we approach a project, we don't really know much about um, the project itself. We try to find out some information, but we might see some resistance um, from, from stakeholders. So we find a way to summarize the information that we are given. But at this, as this project evolves, we, we learn more and more about, um, about the project, what we're trying to tackle, stakeholders, users, etc. So we start getting a better understanding of the data, and, and thus we can move on and create better features. So what do I actually mean by that? So what happens is, tends to be the following. Once, uh, while we go through the, the process of, of gaining domain knowledge, we start to see that the amount of features that we end up using is um, inversely proportionate. So while initially we build a whole bunch of, of features using statistical appro uh, approaches, while we start getting more information about the project, our features actually narrow down to what we believe is more specific. However, we can still get a lot of information just by using a brute force approach, uh, but still thinking about domain knowledge. So we're trying to figure out how do we introduce domain knowledge in our brute force approach of creating statistical features? OK, so what is the, the motivation to, to actually do this? Well, we at Dataiku, we're working with a lot of different co companies from a lot of different industries. And we, we tend to see people kind of facing the same issues, um, whether they're on the business side or on, on the engineering side, or on, they're on the use case side. A lot, of, a lot of our clients are dealing with churn. So they're interested in how to best approach churn. And we look at, at these use cases as, um, as vertical projects. And when we look at them individually, they seem to be very, very different. Some might be tackling churn internally. Some might be tackling churn for external purposes. But in the end, the differences in data are, are not that big. Um, but they're quite unique in the sense of domain knowledge, but you can still try and see that there's things which are common to, to all projects. It would be the same in a, in a fraud detection case, uh, because usually you tend to find transactional data, for example. So there's always some sort of, of structure in the data that we, we, want to, we want to explore. And especially in the use cases that I, that I previously mentioned, we can see two common factors. There's a notion of time, and there's also um, a notion of, of events. So the goal of feature engineering um, in, in those types of cases is how do we actually join the notion of time with the, the notion of events, but also leverage the, the high level information that we, we get um, from the business stakeholders. Normally, we would go about and generate features one by one. But is there any way to, to actually automate this? to make this slightly better. What I actually mean is, how do we get over the really boring part of making features? So my colleague Yu did a very, very scientific survey where he looked at how feature engineering, how long feature engineering takes, and if it's really fun. And he found out that it's not really fun, um, at least not for him. Um, so because he, he wanted to find a way um, on how to change this boring and repetitive project because he was working with a lot of customers, but in the end, he, he noticed that he was using a lot of the, the same features. So that's when, when the internal discussion um, started around this. Also, everybody else in the data science uh, domain tends to do um, automatic feature engineering through diverse ways. Some might be doing it through deep learning, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. So let's look at a, at a few examples of how this data sharing knowledge um, actually occurs. So Airbnb, uh, for example, they have an internal tool called Zipline. What happens within Airbnb is all their different data scientists, whenever they, they query their databases to, to create features, they save all these queries in an internal repository. So everybody else has access to high quality vetted um, ways of, of doing feature generation. Another example is a, is a company called Stitch Fix um, in the US. Um, they decided to, to write their SQL, SQL templates using um, a tool called Jinja2, which is a text template language that supports Flask or Django. And this um, leverages the flexible nature to, to update these, these queries automatically. And then there's also a different type of approach. 
So companies dealing with relational databases, uh, one way to approach this is looking at, at graph dependencies and how tables link up together. It's basically a big join operation between tables, but at the same time, you also augment all the tables with newly created features, uh, well, aggregated features. But in this way, you might end up with a feature that looks something like the sum of the mean of the sum of the sum of column X. A um, system like this does exist, so it's, a, it's an open source uh, it's an open source Python package called Feature Tools, uh, developed, uh, well, yeah, developed by the guys at Feature Labs. So something like this also exists. Um, just looking at the dependency graph and then doing all the computation in Python. So there are a few methods that exist out there. There are, of course, a lot more. Um, but all the methods that um, I've been through right now try and deal with all types of data sets. So they're not, they're, they consider themselves to be limitless. Um, so we wanted to find something a bit more specific that we could actually showcase to, to our peers to make sure that um, they can use it in their day-to-day -day lives and they can immediately see how this would, um, this would relate to them. So we started by reducing the scope of the problem to a very targeted type of data set. A uh, data set with temporal dimensions, like the ones we can use for churn or, or fraud transactions. We also wanted to use general domain knowledge to, to set what the pertinent operations are, but we also wanted to focus on the interpretability of the system, because that's something which a lot of people um, require and we, we think is, is quite necessary to understand how everything works. So this is how Autofeed came, came into play. Um, so what exactly is Autofeed? So Autofeed is a high-level um, Python framework that helps data scientists to generate expressive features um, for their particular problem with a very high-level understanding of the data as well as the use case itself. It basically does all the boring parts that you was talking about um, but it still gives you control of what you actually generate. So you don't just generate a whole bunch of random features and then hope that your algorithm will just choose the best and, and work with them. So if you remember the graph I, I showed initially, our approach basically wants to automate the initial part um, of creating features with some domain knowledge. Um, but we, we always want that domain knowledge to be to be there. So we want to rely on previous experience, but also facilitate um, the, the whole process. So I'm going to, to go a bit deeper into, into Autofeed right now. Um, I'm going to explain the framework for temporal data and the definition of for temporal aggregations. And I'm going to present the, the building block of the package itself, the, the feature factory class. So the first building block is the, the temporal data model. So <clears throat> this basically allows us to, to see the big picture when we do, when we do feature engineering and, and approach it in a, in a logical and reproducible way. Um, so there's, there's a few definitions uh, to be made. So in, in our framework, we, we have a subject that we're looking at, which is basically a, an ensemble of columns um, that defines a smallest unit um, that we're interested in for our project but also um, a state, which, is, which are some columns that describe where that subject is currently in. So what state is he in? And usually every row corresponds to an event or some sort of snapshot of a specific subject state at a, at a specific moment in time. So let's think about a, a normal transactional database um, to, to illustrate some of these ideas. So usually each row is a client purchasing something, let's say a, a product. Um, so the definition in this case, um, it would really depend on the use case. For a pure churn, um, churn use case, the subject would be the client because we're interested um, in when the client will churn. But if we're looking at fraudulent transactions, the level then changes and it becomes more narrow. So we're, just use, we're looking at both the user as well as the timestamp of that particular event. <clears throat> also, um, we have two goals while doing feature engineering um, for, for this, type of, this type of model. 
Um, the first goal is we want to summarize the information that we have available for a particular time window. So, for example, uh, going back to our transactional data, how much did, um, did our client spend in the last three months? Or out of all the products that he bought, um, what's the percentage of groceries or percentage of clothes that, that she bought? But we also want to understand the evolution of our subject through time. Um, this is information around frequency of events as well as recency of events. So, for example, how many, client, how many times did the client purchase something in the last six months? Or when was their last purchase made? So it's, it's things like that that we're, that we're trying to tackle. So remember I was talking about, um, about families of features, so our battleships? So we've looked at several battleships that we, we thought we could find. First one is, is frequency. So how often does a client do a specific action? The second one is recency. So when, when did our client last, um, um, last buy something? Also for, uh, this is a more specific battleship, so something that might be slightly smaller um, and harder to find, but what, what is their spending habits? Uh, so things like, do they always purchase a full dollar amount? Do they spend five cents in every transaction, etc.? But they're also looking at um, distributions. So uh, basically percentage values of categorical columns. So how many events have happened on a, um, on a Sunday? The second building block is temporal aggregation. So how do we take these, uh, these uh, feature families, but walk them and guide them through time? And there's two, two main ways in, in which we can do this. The first one is, is a fixed way. So this, this one-shot aggregation with, with a fixed timestamp tends to be more common in, in train cases. Um, that's actually a, a pretty good example when we know that, that the customer will stop using the product. And we want to find out, well, what was their whole historic activity over the past X days? But there's, there's also another way, <clears throat> doing sequential aggregation with rolling timestamp. So for, for each subject, we, we aggregate features on a rolling period, so event by event. And there is no fixed reference date. There are just intervals, intervals which we would like to define using our own um, domain knowledge on the, on, the subject, on, the, on the topic. So how does the, the package itself actually work? Well, there's basically three phases. The first one is we define some SQL query templates. Um, so even though it's a Python package, everything will uh, also runs in database. So we define SQL query templates with placeholder variables, so things that we want to define at a later stage. So the name of our columns, our temporal conditions, etc. Then we populate the, the placeholders with our desired values. And then finally, we, we translate and, and execute the the SQL scripts. Um, and we, we also have optimization steps within. So for, for every feature family, we create a new script. But then that would result in a lot of different SQL tables. So there is optimization to, to join those tables as well. So let me go into, into a, a specific example. So this is the main class of the package. This is a, a classic fit transform API. Um, where we basically scan the input data set and we store metadata about it. Um, so in this case, we look at user ID. Um, we define what our features would be because we don't always want to, to use all the features. So in this case, we're taking frequency, recency, and, and monetary features. We define our categorical and, and numerical columns. <clears throat> so Basically, this scans the data set, and it, it does schema checks and, and, and quality checks, and then takes this and, and moves it forward to transform everything to the corresponding SQL dialect. So let's say we're trying to, to figure out the, the frequency of buying events in the, in the last six months. So we have to define our window, which is six months. We have to define our primary key, in, in which case, um, it's the user ID. And we also want to add an additional filter because we don't, let's say we have a table where you don't just have buy orders, we have sell orders as well. And we're only interested in buy orders. So the way, the way this actually works is we have information about our metadata 
uh, the one that we're actually creating, so the, the red boxes. Uh, so our interval, our event type, um, which is our filter, and then our, our subject. And then we're automatically creating um, generated, well, we're automatically generating um, features around frequency and, and mean frequency. So finally, uh, uh, a short conclusion. So feature engineering is quite important in day-to-day -day lives of data scientists um, for mainly two purposes. The first one is to increase the performance of predictive models. And the second one is to create some sort of expressive ways in which data scientists or data analysts or business stakeholders have a, a deeper understanding of the, the problem at heart. Um, most approaches so far for automatic feature engineering tend to tackle the, the former. They try to either brute force their way in, creating a whole bunch of different features and either throwing computation or, um, uh, well, yeah, computation or feature reduction mechanism to try and, and narrow down to the best features, but they still have to, to generate everything that's, that's possible. The other way is to use deep learning and don't necessarily understand what the features that you are creating are, but just leading to better performance. And we wanted to, to go into a different direction because in a lot of real life use cases, um, this is not what actually happens. So I was actually talking to, to a data scientist in, in Cambridge the other day, and he was telling me how within their data science team they built a, a great way to figure out um, a fraud for, a, for an online uh, gaming platform that they have. And uh, the model was working very well. The finance team agreed that their model is, go, is working very well, but they didn't understand it because they had no idea what was happening. So it got rejected from being put into production. What they instead did is create features based on decision trees, and then they used those features for rule-based approaches. So that was very, very interesting because that related a lot to what we're trying to do. We're trying to offer interpretability for those people who do have, in the end, domain knowledge, but making sure that they're more effective in, in, how, they do, in how they do their projects. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thanks, you. Thanks, you. Any question? Thanks, really interesting. Um, so you talked about the feature engineering, um, and in terms of interpretability, um, what about evaluating the predictive power of the features that you are producing? Um, do you do that? How do you do that? So no, the, the, the framework itself is just for generating the features. The, analyzing their capability will is done at a later stage by whoever is doing the project itself. It's, it's mainly a tool to help you not do things one by one, but do, well, basically brute force, but brute, brute force with knowledge. So you know that you might have relevant events every three days, three weeks, and three months. So you want to automatically generate that rather than doing it one by one. Good. And just following up on yep. the chat that you showed before showing the percentage, I think it was... Uh, this one? Uh, no, the, the chat where you showed ah, the, yes. the percentage uh, reduction yes. in, well, yes. I think it was the, the feature set yep. size. Um, so yeah, I guess in order to achieve that and reduce the number of features that you use, somehow you need to narrow down to the most predictive ones. That's why I was... Yes, yes. So the, the that, so... You're right. So initially, the the way you climb up to the starting point is brute forcing, and then with domain knowledge, you start uh, reducing some of those. But this gets you to this, basi basically you start later down the line because you already gained some domain knowledge and the features are generated with that, with your help. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, we, we still have time for one or two more questions. Question. Thank you for the talk. Um, do the Python package that you are talking about is a open source package or is it just a feature in DataCube? Uh, 
so currently we're, we're doing code reviews on it. Uh, in terms of open source, that's a discussion with prob which probably you would have uh, would have been better at uh, explaining. Uh, it will definitely be a feature within within Dataiku. I can tell you that for sure. Okay. And uh, if you have uh, any more questions for Dataiku, they have a, a booth just just out of the out of this room. So thank you to to ask them. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, so we are going to carry on on the automa automated uh, automation side of things with uh, David Arnoux from uh, Rap Rapid Miner, who's going to speak about feature data extraction, data merging, data searching, automation. Okay, so just a quick round of applause for David. Yes, thanks for, um, for having me on the stage. And uh, yes, so my talk today will be about smart data search through uh, automatic uh, data search and extraction. And um, let's start with a bit of an, uh, an you know, like a tough assumption and a bit of a simplification. But um, what are the top three assets for machine learning? And but based on the saying in real estate, I would say it's data data and data. So with more data, you will be hopefully be able to build better and more significant machine learning models. So of course, you also have to aim for high quality data. So there's also the saying garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have the right data, it also don't help you. But in most cases, you will hopefully find more and useful, more and useful information with access to more data. And there's where um, one of our research, ongoing research project um, targets for, and this is called DS4DM, Data Search for Data Mining. This is a uh, government state-funded research project uh, Rapid Miner is doing together with the University of Hi uh, Mannheim with a group of uh, Chris Beezer, who's a quite a curiosity in uh, web search and web knowledge design. And the idea here is a bit that uh, we try to tackle all kinds of data sources from the cloud, from web data, or local storage, and bring them together for your data mining problem. So we want to build a data search en engine that indexes and um, aggregates your, those knowledge sources, and then you will be able to automatically integrate, integrate them to your machine learning problem, and you can see here the colors, how they are coming together uh, on this like puzzle pieces to enrich your data set, your, your data you have, and the idea would be then you have better results as before. So first of all, we will start on data extraction. So we are focusing on the targeting new data sources, which aren't so far not covered in most research, uh, in most data science projects. So we all can connect to databases, to Excel files, CSV files, but there are so many hidden gems as data and so many information lying around we want to tackle as well. So we have identified a few interesting targets for data extraction, mainly web or uh, HTML documents, PDF documents, and there's a small uh, constraints about non-scanned PDF documents. Yeah, if you have scanned um, uh, PDF documents, then you are going into the realm of um, OCR, which might be another addition, but currently you're not focusing on. Um, then we have more and more documents in the cloud, like Google Spreadsheets, Microsoft Online, uh, with all the Office documents lying around there. And connected to that, we have the corporate accounts and the big corporate structures, like for example, Microsoft SharePoint drives where whole corporations are putting more and more data into the cloud 
behind this kind of wall. So why are you focusing on these um, docu of document types? And this is an assumption about how the distribution of document formats online is. And of course, we're talking here now only about documents, not about images and videos, which um, probably contribute the most of all internet data. But we see that um, there's a big focus on HTML. But if you take a closer look at the remaining 5%, the huge spike is either PDF data or Excel formats. So here we have a really a rich fountain and a source of knowledge which you can try to integrate into a machine learning problem. So we're talking about PDF documents. This is an, just an example of a PDF, um, PDF table. It's a quite a universal data format used, for example, for legal documents, for research articles. One of the reasons why this is because it's very hard to modify. You have, once you have a PDF, it's more or less, of course, final. But it also makes it very hard to extract information from that. So you can't just copy and paste the table in a PDF form, in a PDF document, and move it over to your machine learning tool or integrate it into Python. So this is, and also these documents are more like a dead end. You have business reports somewhere on your corporate hard drive, and you want you can you can gain a lot of knowledge from those. The other source is, for example, Wikipedia with lots of tables and fitting for this. For example, you have a list of pubs in London. So after awards, after the parties, you want to go out where you can go for, for a pub in, in, in the fitting borough. So you have a vast source of information, for example, in Wikipedia, which is based on the knowledge of the crowd. So it's always updated and probably quite curated. And there are so many other websites outside where you can find information. Um, so the second source will be cloud documents. So there are a lot of data stored in the cloud, often secured through some common uh, security features like OO, for example. And the, the API access to these documents is quite important because you have integrated privacy concerns. So where yeah, manage user rights, so you can manage the user rights, you can revoke user rights, access rights. You have a shared online access. You can easily share documents with colleagues, with other persons. You can freely distribute them or limit the amount of access you can have to those data. And of course, the storage is managed, so you don't have to care about your hard drive is running full, you just order a larger cloud account. So there are more and more documents are pushed into the cloud, and access to them is also focal for gaining information. And with that, I will switch over, hopefully, to a small demo about what we have built so far on, uh, for these tools. So. And show you live. So, uh, in the research project, the nice thing about Rapid Miner is that it's open source and it's easily to uh, open core and it's easily to uh, improve and write new extensions on your own. So, what, that is what we are actually doing in the research team. For this research project, we have created a couple of new operators. And um, so just try out the mouse on this thing, if it works. Yeah, perfect. Or not. So, um, The first thing I want to show is how you can load um, HTML tables, because it's quite an easy format. But also, the table as, as such is quite structured, but finding it on a website can be more tricky. So uh, we have written this new operator, and you can download it via our, our marketplace. And you can define the source where you want to download the data, or you can access the data from. You can either specify a file where it's lying on your machine if you have downloaded it before, or you can directly point to a new URL. In this um, case, I just access the same uh, list of London pubs we have seen before. And oh, it went quite fast. So what we see here is now uh, the overview distributed by uh, neighborhood for all the, all the uh, pubs. And this is already quite a nice data set. You can continue working on and include into your own machine learning source, for example. 
Another um, example just to show you is, for example, if you're not so interested in, uh, in, in drinking, but for perhaps you are more into sports, there is actually, uh, in that case, there's a website that gathers uh, information about uh, college football and statistics about college football. So it's actually quite often and, and curated often, so you can actually poll it regularly. And you get all kinds of information about how your favorite team in US college football is performing. So this is just an example on, on calling HTML tables. Uh, another option is to, to give it a bulk download, to give several um, websites and download those. Uh, another way is then to, to read PDF tables. And here, again, you can either point to an URL so in that case, this long URL is just pointing to the bucket account where we have uh, downloaded one, uh, uh, exposed one demo data file. And again, I can actually pull this PDF table. And what I get here is some, some school information uh, from some school district about the students uh, and their address. And extracting data from PDFs is really tr a bit tricky because you have to detect where in the document lies the table. So this is actually ongoing research. So the operator might not always find the best separation for data, especially if the table is somehow integrated in the document, but we are actually improving it. And actually this one, if it works fine, is really, really helpful to integrate more and more data and more information to your, to your, tool, uh, to your, to your problem. Uh, another way you can access Google Spreadsheets, and this is now the, the realm of API-based access. So um, you have to specify the spreadsheet, the URL of the spreadsheet where it's lying. Uh, you have to define the sheet because, of course, in a document file, a um, spreadsheet can contain several sheets. And what you actually then need is an access token to the API. And how you can get this access token is described in more details here in our help text. You have to log in into your Google account, give it some credentials, and then you can actually download that uh, JSON token file with OAuth to, to, to access it. And again, it hopefully runs, and you can directly uh, read the data out of the, of the online spreadsheet. It took a bit too long, but. It's a course of a live demo. Yeah, oh, as always. But hopefully you, 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 you will understand that it, it, in theory it works. And this is quite helpful because then you can talk to your business accountant or people from marketing who are not data scientists, but they are familiar with Excel. So they can put in the data from an Excel file online and you can directly pull it. So you don't have to wait to that they send you the data via email or USB six. You can directly access their data from, an, uh, from a spreadsheet account. And the same works as well with Google Spreadsheets uh, and, and Microsoft Online, uh, sorry, from, with Microsoft Online. And another feature which, um, i just stop this one, somehow the access token is broken, um, is uh, Google actually is offering not only to search for websites, but it also offers you the opportunity to search for, do uh, for document tables directly. So you can use this, um, Google table search, which is actually an API from, from Google itself. And you can specify some keywords, just like from a Google search. And we are looking for football clubs in that case. We can specify the amount of results we want to get. So we only want the top 20 results. And of course, you want to get the, only the un unique results. And what we can get here, I might just add a breakpoint here so we get see the results from this res from the search. So we see here some kind of uh, links Google has provided us from where it has found this web table. So for example, also again, a list of from Wikipedia about football clubs, uh, some the website directly from Chelsea, yeah. uh, and, and other information. For example, here quite interesting, uh, Wikipedia was Google search for quite, is ranked quite high and search often is the information from Forbes about the most valuable football clubs. So we can use this data, these results, this list, and actually put it into our reach HTML table operator with, as, a, as a bulk download and read all these 
spreadsheet uh, tables at once. So as a result, we get a, quite a few of, uh, number of tables with all kinds of information based from these ta um, websites. So for example, here we get the, here this one is the, the, the FOB index about the, the value, most valuable teams, and we see Real Madrid and then Manchester are the highest, uh, most valuable teams, at least from that standpoint. But this led us to, to the actual problem. These, those tables look all quite differently. And if we have a common schema from our problem, how we can integrate this new find information, uh, newly found information, into our project, uh, into your task at hand. And so I will switch back to the. Sorry. Hmm. It's stuck. You would think that something like this wouldn't be so difficult. Okay. So uh, I skipped those. These are the. Uh, the same demonstration uh, from uh, from the demo at the backup. So now an interesting point, and that's actually where we are uh, conducting our research, is the data discovery. So we have now a target on new data sources. We have downloaded them and perhaps indexed them in our um, search engine searchable um, database. We are currently using Lucene as an index database. And now there's a question how we can integrate them into our problem. So as an example, we, this uh, data search extension is focusing on, the, on a concept called search join, which is nothing we came up with, but it's a concept in the web search community. Uh, there are a lot of research going on uh, concerning this topic. And it's actually a data enrichment method. So in this case, we have a table, with, for example, with country, region, and language. And now we will be interested in the currency in this country. So what you can do is actually, so we want to have this currency table uh, column filled up. And um, so the actual problem is to find relevant tables that can extend to by uh, this, uh, or existing table with a new attribute or a new column. So we have two kinds of matches. We have a schema matches, schema correspondence, so which columns look similar. So we find tables where, for example, we have columns with country and currency, that would be perfect. But also we have instance correspondence, so where we are matching on each single row or each single example or in, um, entry in the row, because also the, the kind of um, information stored in each of the tables might be different. So um, first of all, we are using a search operator to discover relevant tables, and um, then we get a whole list of them. But of course, these kind of tables, as you have seen, can look quite differently, and they are susceptible to noise. There can be all kinds of data. For example, if you're looking for currency in Wikipedia, we get all kinds of currency tables or um, lists containing currencies. For example, there might be a list of historical currencies used by countries. And we are not interested in sterling or other old currencies, but we are interested in modern currencies. So actually, we have to curate them, and we have um, control a bit about what kind of data we want to integrate and what not. So we have a graphical interface where you can take a look at all, all of these tables, select the most relevant, take a look at the distribution and say, okay, I want to have this, on, not, uh, this table included in my data or not. And then it comes the integration problem because, of course, we find now lots of tables that contain some information. For example, here we see the top one has countries, continents, and currency. That's quite nice. The other one has something called state, language, money use, which is also a similar concept. So by schema, uh, by instance correspondence, we might have identified that this one is also a fitting target. And now we want to translate so all these schemas into a relevant table and get a new overview and get merge information from all kinds of these um, integrate uh, data found into one fitting. 
So first of all, we have to translate the tables on an instant level, so they're fitting each description of, the in, of each cell in the data. And then we have to join them again, like fuse. And there are several um, instances of how we can jo uh, join the, uh, the, the fusion policy. So for example, if you're looking for currency of the United States, you might have find tables with US dollar, or simply dollar, or the dollar symbol. And then we can have to decide which one we want to use. So there are a few po uh, policies. For example, you just use the first one, the more simple, or we go by average or maximum vote. So this is actually something we're currently uh, doing more and more research on finding an optimal fusion strategy to integrate those kind of data. Um, actually, there's also an already existing extension for this where you can play around with. Currently, it's backed and by the search index from the University of Mannheim. Uh, which has an index about over 5 million Wikipedia tables. But the long-running idea is that you be able to set up your own search base, for example, set up with all the other things you have seen before on all the operators to access other sources of data, to build your own search index based, for example, on your corporate network or private data, and then tap into these kinds of resources. So uh, this together now gives a nice holistic overview. So we have identified new extraction targets where you want from where you can download or gain new knowledge. And then you can put it into all different steps of the rapid miner process from data preparation. You can filter those results. You can prepare them. You can analyze them. You can normalize them. And then you can enrich your existing data with this search join um, approach to get better results, and then you can build your model on it, you can validate your model, and then even put it into production. Like, it's easy to oper operationalize. So we can, um, on the left-hand side, you see the traditional sources, RabbitMiner's already targeting, like Hadoop, offline Excel files, databases, and so on. And in the, on the right side, now we are pushing those results found uh, and enriched from the new data sources. Uh, and put it into production, like for example, putting it on a web server, exposing them at the web servers, uh, hosting it again in the cloud, building spreadsheet reports, or some kind of other online alert. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Um, I will, um, in the end of the slides, there's a list on our community articles about where you, um, on, on how the actual extensions work and how you can uh, set it up for yourself. So if you're interested in, take a look at the community, or otherwise uh, just contact me. I'm still also here uh, for the rest of the day, down at the booth or about here. And thanks for having me on stage. Thank you. Thank you, David. Very good talk. So we, we have plenty of time for questions. So I have questions. <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned this tool is open source, right? Uh, open core. So we, you oh. can take a, take a look at the all other operators. You can extend it for yourself. All right. And we have some commercial features. So if I want to implement my own uh, data extraction target, I, I can do it for my own schema, my own files. Uh, if you have a certain specific files where, where you're interested in, you can write your own operator for it. And if you're really nice, you can also publish it on our marketplace so you can share it with others. Okay, so there's a marketplace for, for Yes, this we kind. have a marketplace for extensions. A lot of them come from ourselves, but also we are working together with universities, and then you can ex, um, expose your own extensions. Okay, and a following question. Uh, what's the language of the extension? What are uh, we are, the, the back end is written in Java. Java. But for your, if you're interested, you can also integrate Python or R code. We have um, interpreters for them. So you can plug in your Python and R algorithms also inside the rapid miner process. All right. With the data integration tools, um, can you talk a bit more about how you maintain data accuracy, see when you have two tables with competing entries and columns? Yeah, that is a bit of a question where actually the research is going on. So for example, we have this fusion policy when you have found several tables and then you can take a look on how you want to integrate them. So for example, you take an average or take the one where you trust the most. So this is the point where you have to fuse them so somehow. So the user can pick which data source they trust more than others? 
Yes, for example, that is the point where you have in the beginning where you can select some data, where, for example, you can deselect certain ones where you don't trust, or you can say, okay, this is probably not the right one, okay. and you can actually manually. Also, we offer some, I haven't shown it, some visual exploration to like SOMs and S3D graphs where you can see how tables are related to each other, so you can see, okay, there's a certain cluster with similar tables, so probably I want to take one of those and not some outlier. Okay, great, thank you. Another question is about um, automation. So you, you demonstrated that you were able to run the job manually. Uh, I suspect you can also automate that and schedule. Of course, with Rapid Miner Server, you can uh, make a schedule out of it and pull it regularly and, and also execute it regularly. All right. Okay. Uh, any any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if you have any other questions, you can reach David. Um, so after after this uh, talk, we are going to end uh, the session for this morning. We're going to have a small break for lunch, and we'll start again at uh, half past one, I believe, for the next talk. So you can you can enjoy. Um, coffee break, you can have some discussion with the previous speakers, the, um, the companies that are there, or between each other, and, uh, and we'll see you again, hopefully, at uh, half past one to, for the next, for this afternoon round of uh, talks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>